On the afternoon of Wednesday, September 18, 2008, Jonathan Reeves was driving down a quiet street in Santa Ana, California. Lost in his thoughts, he arrived at his mother's house and began unloading the furniture he had brought for her. Jonathan was startled, sensing that something was wrong. His mother, Darlene Sadler, always came outside when she heard him pull up or, at the very least, waved to him from the window. He brushed off the uneasy feeling, assuming she was busy, but as he approached the door, he found it unlocked. His mother never left the door open. Growing more concerned, Jonathan entered the house and walked toward the kitchen. There, he made a horrifying discovery. His mother was lying face down on the floor, motionless. A pool of blood surrounded her, and a knife was protruding from her neck. Jonathan had barely begun to process what had happened when another thought struck him. His mother didn't live alone. She shared the house with Jonathan's two younger sisters. The older girl, April, was at school, but the five-year-old should have been at home. Panicked, Jonathan ran to find her and discovered the little girl in her room. She was alive, but he had no time to hold on to the relief that she was safe. When he dialed 911, Jonathan told the operator that his sister had been home during the attack on their mother. The operator, not realizing how young the girl was, matter-of-factly asked what his sister had told him. Jonathan handed the phone to his sister, and with a trembling voice she told the dispatcher that a stranger had killed her mom with her own kitchen knife. The dispatcher sighed heavily, realizing she was speaking to a very young child who had witnessed her mother's murder. The woman tried to gently ask the girl what other details she remembered about the attacker. Jonathan listened in horror as his sister described a thin man dressed all in black, with a black mask on his face and, strangely, blue hair. Though the five-year-old understood something terrible had happened to her mom, she couldn't fully grasp the situation. She tearfully explained that she had cried but had thought to put a band-aid on the wounds, sincerely believing that it would help her mom. When the paramedics arrived, they had no choice but to confirm that 49-year-old Darlene Sadler was beyond help. She had been dead for several hours. However, they noticed something unusual. Despite the knife lodged in her neck, Darlene had also sustained gunshot wounds. An autopsy would soon reveal that she had been shot three times in the head before being stabbed. Both the gunshots and the knife wound were fatal on their own, meaning someone had gone to great lengths to ensure Darlene would not survive. The knife used belonged to Darlene, as one from her kitchen knife set was missing. The autopsy also established an estimated time of death, around 9.30 a.m. This meant Jonathan's younger sister had spent approximately five hours near her mother's body before her brother found her. Given the blood splatters on the kitchen cabinets, walls, and even the ceiling, detectives concluded that the murder had taken place in the kitchen. However, that wasn't the only area where blood was found. There was some smudged blood on the front door and tiny droplets on the hallway floor. These droplets appeared to have been left slightly earlier than the ones at the crime scene. All samples were sent to the lab for analysis. The last piece of evidence at the crime scene was just as promising, a shell casing from a 22 caliber weapon. Since Darlene had been shot three times, detectives theorized that the killer had taken the other two casings with them, but had somehow missed this one, which was left on the kitchen table. It was crucial for the investigation to find out what Darlene's five-year-old daughter had witnessed. However, given the child's age and the traumatic experience she had just endured, this had to be handled with the utmost sensitivity. A professional who specializes in working with children who have experienced traumatic events was brought in to speak with the girl. For the most part, she repeated the details she had already shared with the 911 dispatcher. She reiterated that the killer was dressed all in black and reminded her of a ninja. The detail about the blue hair was unclear. It was possible that the girl mentioned it simply because she was eager to answer all of the dispatcher's questions. Detectives dismissed this detail as a product of the child's imagination. Before the conversation ended, the girl agreed to draw two pictures of what she had seen. At first glance, the drawings seemed innocent, but they were anything but. She explained that the first drawing depicted her mother lying on the floor with her eyes closed. In the second drawing, the girl illustrated the knife that had been used to stab her mother. Not wanting to put any additional pressure on the child, the police concluded their conversation with her at that point. Detectives also spoke with Darlene's older children. Initially, they were considered potential suspects, but they could also provide valuable information about their mother's life. First, they spoke with Jonathan. After his employer confirmed that he was at work during the time of the murder, Jonathan was cleared as a suspect. 
He then shared a lot of interesting information about his mother's life. Darlene was the mother of four children. She worked hard and did everything she could to provide a better life for Jonathan and his sisters, often doing it on her own. In her early 20s, she gave birth to Jonathan and his sister Jessica. However, when Jonathan was just two years old, their father passed away. Darlene remarried, and in 1992, she gave birth to his middle sister, April. But her second husband abandoned the family and eventually left the country altogether. A few years later, Darlene tried to rebuild her personal life again when she fell in love with a man named Dexter. They married in 2003, and Darlene gave birth to her youngest daughter. Unfortunately, the relationship between the spouses soon deteriorated, and Dexter moved out. So on the day of the attack on Darlene, the situation was as follows. Jonathan and Jessica had grown up and were living separately. Jessica's alibi was confirmed, and she was never suspected of her mother's murder. Darlene lived with her two younger daughters, who were 15 and 5 years old. Dexter had moved to Bakersfield, more than 200 kilometers away from Santa Ana. The couple had not yet officially divorced. From the conversation with Jonathan, it became clear that he loved his mother deeply and understood how difficult it had been for her to raise the children alone. Jonathan considered Darlene to be a wonderful mother who worked tirelessly to provide for her children, despite the challenges. She also made sure to spend as much time as possible with them. Overall, she was a kind and pleasant person. Like Jonathan and Jessica, 15-year-old April was initially considered a suspect, but her alibi was confirmed. Her mother had dropped her off at school, where she spent the entire day without missing a single class. April admitted that she and her mother often argued, but she pointed out that this happens in all families with teenage children. It was clear, however, that she was very upset by what had happened and was grieving for her mother. When asked if she could think of anyone who might have wanted to harm her mother, April immediately mentioned her stepfather, Dexter. Darlene and Dexter met about ten years ago at a mutual friend's party. They got married two years later. Although their relationship was initially great, according to April, things took a turn for the worse after the birth of their youngest daughter. Around that time, Dexter lost his job as a musician and turned to substances and alcohol, issues he had struggled with in the past. April explained that his addiction created tension in the relationship. Dexter became aggressive, sometimes even raising his hand against Darlene or insulting her. Darlene was not the kind of person who would tolerate such behavior, especially in front of her children. As a result, the couple separated, and Dexter moved to Bakersfield. However, the separation didn't last long. A few months before the murder, Dexter suddenly reappeared in the family's life, claiming he wanted to reconcile with his wife. He was very convincing, assuring Darlene that he had changed. Since Darlene didn't want her youngest daughter to grow up without a father, she decided to take him back. They even started planning a move to the nearby city of Santa Clarita. But as the moving day approached, it became clear that Dexter had deceived her. He hadn't overcome his addictions and was far from being a responsible parent. When Darlene confronted him about this, April said he became furious. The couple had a heated argument and Dexter threatened her, saying that if she didn't make the right choice, she would disappear from this world. This terrifying threat was made about a month before Darlene's murder. When Dexter was questioned, he denied everything April had said, claiming he was never aggressive towards his wife. He admitted they had problems but denied ever threatening Darlene. He also insisted that the plan to reconcile and move to another city was still in place. Moreover, Dexter had an alibi. He spent September 18th at work in Bakersfield, and several people were willing to confirm this. While some detectives were verifying Dexter's alibi, others were following additional leads. It quickly became apparent that there was no shortage of people who might have had a motive to kill Darlene. As investigators discovered, a young man named Jacob had lived with the family for a while. He was in his early 20s at the time. Jacob was the son of a close friend of Darlene and a friend of her son, Jonathan. Darlene had known him since childhood, and when he had a falling out with his parents in 2006, she allowed him to stay at her home. At first, everything seemed fine, but at some point, something happened between him and April. Jacob claimed that they had a genuine romantic relationship, but Darlene was not convinced. The word abuse was even mentioned concerning April. It's unclear what exactly transpired between the two, but Darlene believed that her daughter was at the very least too young for a relationship. She ended up kicking Jacob out of the house, which infuriated him. He even threatened her. Although more than a year had passed since then, it was possible that Jacob harbored a grudge against Darlene. 
the police certainly thought it was worth investigating further. Meanwhile, the police officer spoke again with Darlene's younger five-year-old daughter. They hadn't pressured her during the first conversation when she repeated what she had told the emergency dispatcher. But now, she might have something important to share about her mother's last days. This is what the little girl remembered. A couple of weeks ago, she and her mother were grocery shopping when a man approached them in the parking lot. The girl recognized him. His name was Finn. 56-year-old Finn and Darlene had an argument, and the man threatened to stab Darlene in the neck. Now she was dead, and someone had stabbed her exactly as the man had threatened. The investigators discovered that Darlene and Finn had met 20 years ago. They had dated briefly, but decided to remain friends. However, a few months ago, Finn lost his rental home and had nowhere to stay. Since Darlene had a spare bedroom, she agreed to rent it to him for a small amount of money. Initially, everything went well, although Darlene's daughters, especially April, were not thrilled about the new tenant. Soon, Finn stopped paying for the room. When Darlene asked him to move out, he agreed but made no secret of his anger towards her. As the investigators looked into Finn's background, they were in for another surprise. The man had a history of domestic violence and aggravated assault. He needed to be questioned immediately. The way Jacob and Finn, former housemates of Darlene, described the situation from their perspective was far less alarming than what the investigators had initially heard. Jacob insisted that he and April genuinely liked each other. He admitted that he was upset when Darlene kicked him out, but he quickly moved on and certainly did not threaten her. Finn, on the other hand, openly admitted that he had threatened Darlene outside a store but claimed it was a joke. Despite the fact that a threat to stab someone in the neck is hard to interpret as a joke, he maintained that he wasn't the killer. Finn also had an alibi. He had visited a doctor that day, a fact corroborated by his girlfriend and other witnesses. But there was one more very interesting lead. When the police interviewed the woman's neighbors, someone mentioned a house where people who were finishing a rehabilitation program for addiction lived. The house was located about a kilometer and a half from Darlene's home, and the locals were not thrilled about the dubious characters who frequented it. The detectives went there, and the facility's administrator expressed concerns about a man named Chad. Recently, Chad had been acting strangely and suddenly left town a few hours after Darlene's murder. Later, Chad called the administrator and confirmed only that he had left town, but did not explain why. However, he did mention that he was in Bakersfield, which was the same city where Darlene's third husband, Dexter, lived. Investigators wondered if these events might be connected. Now, the police had a list of suspects, and the detectives were certain that one of them was definitely the killer. It remained to figure out who. Fortunately, doing that was simple. A few days into the investigation, the detectives received news from the forensic lab. The blood analysis from the crime scene had arrived. The results were promising, but somewhat confusing. Naturally, most of the blood in the house belonged to Darlene. However, the blood on the door did not. It belonged to a man. There was also blood from a third person. Female DNA was found in some long dried droplets in the hallway. It turned out unexpectedly that the blood in the hallway belonged to April. Naturally, the detectives were intrigued and spoke with the girl again, who had been living with a foster family temporarily after Darlene's murder. However, the girl was able to explain everything. She had occasionally self-harmed by cutting her skin. She showed the scars on her wrists that confirmed her story. She hadn't mentioned this earlier because she had stopped self-harming and was afraid that if she told the police, they would force her to see a therapist or enter a specialized facility. Adolescents sometimes self-harm as a reaction to difficult situations at school or at home. Since April claimed she no longer engaged in self-harm and the blood in the hallway had been there long before the murder, she was allowed to return home. The detectives then turned their attention to more promising evidence, the smudged bloodstains on the door. It was almost certain that the blood smudged on the door had been left by the killer as they were leaving the crime scene. DNA samples were taken from each of the suspects, and it turned out that the blood did not belong to any of Darlene's former neighbors or her third husband, Dexter. However, there was still the issue of Chad, who had abruptly left town and gone to Bakersfield. Detectives wondered if Dexter might have hired Chad to commit the crime, and if Chad had then gone to Bakersfield to collect payment for his work. This theory seemed plausible when Chad's facility administrator showed the detectives items Chad had left behind. There were stains on his shoes that resembled blood. However, the analysis revealed that these stains were actually oil. Additionally, investigators were unable to find any connection between Chad and Dexter. With little hope for success, Chad's DNA was also tested. 
The blood on Darlene's door did not match Chad's. It appeared that Chad had no involvement in the case at all. As a last resort, detectives compared the DNA sample against the CODIS database of known criminals, but this too brought disappointment. At this point, the investigation hit a dead end. There were no new leads, and the existing ones had been exhausted. Weeks went by, and although the police were reluctant to admit it, the case was slipping into the background. Fortunately, they were soon to receive one final lead that would not only reveal who killed Darlene, but also help the police understand why they had been headed in the wrong direction from the start. Several months after Darlene's murder, the police unexpectedly received a call from Darlene's son, Jonathan. He revealed that his sister, April, might have crucial information for the investigation. She had told him about her former boyfriend, 18-year-old Brian Paul Landry. April had only recently come to realize that he could be behind the murder. Through tears, she recounted to her brother that she and Brian had met a few months before Darlene's murder. They spent much of the summer together, but Brian took things too seriously. April was already planning to break up with him when her mother intervened. Brian had confessed to Darlene that he wanted to marry April. Darlene told Brian that he was out of his mind and that they were too young, especially her daughter. She then asked him not to come to their home anymore. April said that right after Darlene's murder, she didn't think of Brian because they had been out of touch for some time. But the more she thought about it, the more she suspected him, especially considering Brian's interest in firearms. He had several at his home. Detectives followed up on this lead by gathering information about Brian. He seemed an unlikely candidate for a violent murderer. He was studying religion and languages in college and appeared to be an ordinary guy. He had no prior arrests or any legal troubles. However, his social media revealed an unhealthy obsession with firearms. Some videos showed Brian handling various guns with evident admiration. His family knew about his fascination, and even his grandmother had gifted him a pistol. Brian had planned to channel his interest into a military career, but one photo was more unsettling. On social media, detectives found a blurry image of Brian dressed in all black, with a ski mask covering his face. This resembled the description of the killer given by Darlene's younger daughter. The detectives decided they needed to obtain Brian's DNA. To avoid arousing his suspicion, they invited him to the station under the pretense of identifying a bicycle reported stolen by Brian. Of course, they hadn't found his bicycle. They just needed him to drink from a bottle of water they provided. This allowed them to obtain his DNA, which matched the DNA left by the killer on the door of Darlene's house. On April 16, 2009, Brian was brought in for questioning. The detectives were polite and delicate with him, allowing him to feel comfortable and answer questions in his own way. They let him lie, digging himself deeper and deeper. Brian claimed that he and Darlene had a good relationship, and that on the day of her murder, he had been attending a campus event at his college. Eventually, they informed him that they had his DNA, which was found on the door at the crime scene, and asked him to explain. In response, Brian inquired about his rights, such as having a lawyer or remaining silent. The detectives confirmed that he indeed had those rights. However, unexpectedly, he waived them and told the detectives everything. Brian's account was chilling. He admitted to killing Darlene, but he claimed it wasn't his idea. The plan to kill Darlene had been entirely devised by her daughter, April. However, this was not a shock to the police, as by the time they questioned Brian, April was already under suspicion. When they began investigating Brian's connection to the case, they unexpectedly discovered that April had continued to communicate with Brian during Darlene's murder. In other words, she hadn't cut off contact with him as she had claimed. She had sent him messages before, during, and after the murder of her mother. Despite their suspicions, the detectives did not anticipate Brian revealing all the details of the conspiracy. He explained that after their breakup, April blamed her mother for everything and was furious at the thought of Darlene rekindling her relationship with Dexter. The couple was planning to move to another city, which would force April to switch schools and leave all her friends behind. Therefore, she devised a way to solve all her problems. She needed to get rid of her mother. For the role of the killer, she chose Brian, who had a convenient obsession with firearms. April had been plotting this for a long time. As later recounted by her former boyfriend Jacob, who had lived in her house for a while, April had expressed her desire to kill her mother and mentioned that Brian would help her. Jacob suspected that April might have been cheating on him with Brian, trying to persuade him to do as she wished. But at that time, it seemed to be just talk. 
and Jacob was not involved in the final stages of the conspiracy. Brian told the police that he initially refused to commit the crime outright and didn't even want to hear about it. However, April didn't back down and used various forms of pressure until she found one that worked. She threatened Brian, saying that if he didn't help her, she would do it herself when she turned 18 but would kill both her mother and herself. When Brian finally agreed, they chose a date and time to ensure that no suspicion would fall on April. They selected September 18th because April would be at school and Brian would have no classes at college. On the morning of September 18th, Brian packed a backpack with the items needed for the crime, a weapon, dark clothing, a pair of gloves, and the mask that the young girl had seen. He then hopped on his bike and headed to Darlene's house, arriving at 9 a.m. The house was empty because Darlene and her younger daughter had taken April to school. Brian changed clothes around the corner from the house and then opened the door from the inside by reaching through the mail slot. He entered the house and waited for the victim to return. When Darlene and her daughter came back home, Brian waited a few minutes and then approached Darlene in the kitchen. The girl was in her room, and Darlene had started preparing something, facing the sink. Brian shot Darlene in the head, and she fell to the floor. The loud noise attracted the younger daughter, who ran to see what was happening. To prevent her from seeing more, Brian took the girl to her bedroom and then returned to the kitchen. He shot Darlene twice more and then stabbed her with a kitchen knife, making sure she was dead. Brian collected the shell casings, but decided that one had fallen into the sink and didn't search for it. Despite wearing gloves, he accidentally cut himself and left his blood on the door. The killer fled, pausing only to text April that the deed was done. Ballistic tests confirmed that the fatal bullets came from Brian's weapon, which had been gifted to him by his grandmother. However, investigators were convinced that Brian was telling the truth and that April was the mastermind behind the crime. She had been pulling the strings of the investigation from the start. April had cleverly provided herself with an alibi and initially directed suspicion towards her stepfather. When that failed, she tried to pin the blame entirely on Brian. Brian proved to be an easy target for manipulation. As one investigator recalled, there were moments during their interactions when he realized she was interrogating him rather than the other way around. If she could pull such a trick with an experienced homicide detective, it was hardly surprising that she could manipulate an 18-year-old infatuated with her. April and Brian were arrested and charged with murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Brian was found guilty and sentenced to prison from 25 years to life in 2012. He will be eligible for parole in November 2025. April was also found guilty, but given her age, her sentence was much lighter. She could be held in a juvenile detention facility only until the age of 25 and was released in 2017. For this reason, as well as to protect the identity of Darlene's younger daughter, April's name, like those of many other witnesses and suspects in the case, was changed. Although court documents mentioning the real names, including April's, can be found online, most sources prefer to use the altered names. After her release, April made numerous attempts to contact Jonathan, but he has no desire to communicate with the sister he blames much more for their mother's death than Brian. After Darlene's murder, her five-year-old daughter went to live with her father's family. Jonathan now runs a successful business and has a wonderful family, including a son, but he admits that the more beautiful moments occur in his life, the more they remind him that his mother will never see any of them. Her life was taken not by an accident or illness, but by her own daughter, for whom she had strived to be the best mother possible, and that cannot be changed.